Benjamin Lau was born this fall. He was transferred from the western side of the state at about 20 hours of life due to extreme liver failure. He entered our neonatal ICU. He was evaluated by quite a cadre of physicians actually due to his extreme illness. And eventually he met members of our team. Uh, he was heard about in one of our infectious disease uh, meetings where Terry Stilwell, who was part of our team, actually recognized his phenotype as consistent with hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH. And I think that is really to credit to Terry, but also a marker of how important it is to have multidisciplinary care in these patients because they're quite complex, and we don't always get called about them right away. Uh, ben focused um, very hard on trying to get his immune suppression down. For those of you who are unfamiliar with HLH, it's actually both a genetic disorder and an acquired disorder in some cases where the immune system gets activated appropriately and it revs up to fight whatever stimulus is there, but then it just can't shut itself down. And so we attempted several times for Benjamin to turn off his immune system, which we did with some success. However, we always have a bit of a price to pay when we use immune suppression, which of course is a risk of infection. And unfortunately, Benjamin passed away uh, just a few short weeks into his life. All of our patients that we treat are touching our lives in certain ways, but I have to say helping take care of Benjamin and his family was very inspiring to us. They have gone out of their way to make sure that the education of HLH is much more recognized throughout our entire health system. And through his illness, he met virtually every service in the hospital. And for HLH, we see a lot of it in younger kids, um, usually not in infants, and then quite a lot in adults. Um, but the neonatal ICU just hadn't seen that many cases. And through Benjamin's case, they've actually become much more aware. We had a second case just a few weeks ago where actually, instead of getting diagnosed on day of life 14, the child was actually rapidly recognized by the admitting pediatric resident um, within the first few hours of arrival at the University of Michigan, and in fact was able to start therapy within 24 hours of arrival, um, which was a big difference, and I think really a credit to all the effort that your family, um, Mandy and Tim, have offered to our institution, so we thank you. And even though Benjamin was only with us for a few weeks, he's actually done quite a few things. Uh, he has inspired many bone marrow drives, which his family and many of their community friends have generously put forward. And while this doesn't always happen, he's actually already managed to save four lives. And through those bone marrow drives, just a few months ago, he actually had four hits for potential matches, and all four of those matches went on to help other patients. So we're very grateful for both Tim and Mandy for putting this award forward. And I think Jim's going to talk about our awardee for this year. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our first uh, Benjamin uh, Lau Award winner, uh, Dr. Adam Duvall. Uh, so Kelly and I have had uh, have gotten to know Adam quite a bit um, since uh, he's been um, here as a resident at the University of Michigan and ha has been one of the brightest residents that uh, we've had the pleasure of working with. Um, Adam uh, did his undergraduate at Notre Dame, um, where he uh, majored in pre-med, but also theology and German. Um, and then he went on to receive his MD and MPH at Case, Case Western Reserve. Um, he did a pretty amazing uh, research project um, during his time there. Um, and uh, during his research there is that he was looking at the transmission dynamics of multiple parasites um, and the interactive effect on the human population. And this is really a global research project. Um, Dr. Duvall um, actually went um, to Kenya and did research within the field. And so he was out there uh, collecting samples um, and not only doing research, but actually providing education um, to um, the uh, people that were native to Kenya and teaching them how to perform lab laboratory techniques. So really amazing work that he did as um, a medical student. Um, he then went on to come to the University of Michigan where he is now a third year um, internal medicine uh, combined pediatric uh, resident. Um, and he is currently um, in application to um, pursue a hematology oncology fellowship. Um, Dr. Duvall has really kind of gained a interest in immunohematology and um, it's been great to uh, work with him. Um, um, as his interest has grown in this uh, amazing field. Um, he has grown specific interest in HLH, um, and in fact, um, 
uh, Dr. Duvall has actually identified several adult patients um, with HLH that um, have uh, been not only in young patients like um, Ben, but also in older patients, it can be difficult to be recognized. Um, but he has um, certainly um, gained expertise in HLH um, through his training here and a lot of his own work. Um, so he, um, um, he is um, currently um, developing a project to actually um, look at um, HLH, in particular looking at um, the effect of cytokine expression um, um, that will occur in patients with HLH and perhaps using those as markers for treatment. Um, and we're, wor and uh, we're working with him to develop this project currently. Um, he is going to give a very interesting case presentation um, to one of our um, other favorite patients, um, Cole, um, who um, may say a few words um, during the presentation. Um, uh, Cole is um, uh, a patient who developed HLH uh, driven by EBV and developed some very unique features of the disease, which uh, Dr. Duvall will um, go over. Um, so, Adam, you want to come up? And uh, thank you again, Ben and um, Tim and Mandy. We really appreciate all of your efforts to make this award possible for our trainees. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Walkovich, or Dr. Walkovich and Dr. Connolly, um, and really thank you to the Lau family too. It's uh, I, I was involved in the case peripherally, just um, given my interest in that I was around, and um, <clears throat> it was really a, an, an, an amazing son. And we appreciate you, uh, kind of your dedication to the field and, and your help here. I'm presenting a different case as um, Dr. Connolly mentioned. It's uh, Cole over there in the corner. So I have no financial. Disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, so our, boy, our, our case starts when uh, Cole was 29 months old. Um, his medical history was rather uh, unremarkable. He had a eczema, a little failure to thrive, so he didn't grow quite as well, and he had a little bit of uh, developmental delay. His symptoms started with about four to five days history of cough, congestion, and fever. And he went to the emergency department eventually um, after developing some difficulty breathing. There, he was quite ill-appearing. In fact, he um, it was eventually admitted to the ICU, but he was, uh, his exam was notable for uh, wheezing, uh, enlarged lymph nodes, and enlarged liver and spleen. Uh, he was treated for status asthmaticus, given this history of eczema, which is an allergic kind of atopic um, condition. His initial laboratory values were relatively remarkable from a CBC standpoint. His white blood cell count was only 11.8. It did increase during the, his stay to a maximum of 129,000. Uh, the most notable thing from this is that 90% of uh, the lymphocytes were B cells. Uh, this is a very ab abbrevi abbreviated kind of presentation of his course because he was here qu for quite some time. But eventually EBV testing was sent and it was notable for a positive IgM and a positive PCR, which is uh, indicative of a acute infection. I'd like to briefly review kind of uh, the uh, mechanism of infection of EBV <clears throat> because it's important in this case. So EBV <clears throat> uh, infects through CD21 which is expressed in the nasopharyngeal epithelial cells and additionally in B cells. The initial phase is usually what's called the lytic phase. So you'll have a rapid proliferation of B cells and eventually the cells will lyse and release virus to infect other cells. As you can see here, uh, the CD8 cells and the CD4 cells will uh, kill these B cells, and the natural killer cells will, will react to kill these B cells and control the population. Remember, in Cole's case, he had 90% of his lymphocytes were B cells, so for some reason this was not effectively what was going on. The EBV infection will eventually enter a latent phase with transient expression of, of or transient um, entering of the uh, cells into the lytic phase, releasing virus uh, at that time, but in general, the population is controlled by the CD8 um, cytotoxic T cells. Uh, and usually you don't have significant viremia during the um, late or lytic reactivations, nor will you have um, uh, significant symptoms. This is important for Cole later on. 
So unfortunately, poor Cole continued to be sick. He deteriorated despite um, broad spectrum antibiotics for infection, bronchodilators and steroids, which are really the mainstay of asthma treatment. He eventually required intubation and mechanical ventilation for respiratory support. He f further went on to develop multi-organ failure. He eventually required ECMO, which is oxygenation outside of the body, and dialysis, which is a type of renal replacement therapy. Uh, eventually, imaging um, was performed and, and showed diffuse cervical and mediastinal lymphadenopathy. You can see it here. The gray part in the middle is all of the enlarged lymph nodes. The little black spots in the middle of the gray part are his airways. And you can see he's breathing through really what's smaller than a straw, just given all of the obstruction from his enlarged lymph nodes. A lymph node biopsy was performed. It was notable for a polymorphous lymphoid infiltrate, so these were both uh, CD3 and CD20 positive cells, so both B and T cells. Um, one of the most notable findings also was hemophagocytic histiocytes, so uh, hemo uh, something that's indicative of possible HLH, which Dr. Walkovich already described. Uh, one of the most thing, or the other things that's important, if you remember back to the life cycle of EBV, it usually infects B cells and the T cells um, uh, control the infection. However, there's diffuse positivity in both T cells and B cells for EBER, EBER which is a marker of uh, EBV infection. So EBV was actually infecting the T cells. A bone marrow biopsy was performed, and it showed uh, B cell expansion, but something that was most consistent with an EBV infection. Peripheral blood was obtained, and as we uh, already mentioned, uh, there was marked B cell expansion, but there was not the significant uh, CD8 T cell response, um, like I initially talked about, that would normally control this B cell expansion in the setting of EBV infection. Additional laboratory evaluation was performed um, given the hemophagocytosis um, with uh, elevated ferritin, low fibrinogen, elevated soluble interleukin-2 receptor, and decreased NK cell function. All of these are, uh, were sent given the concern for HLH. Here are the diagnostic criteria for HLH. I'm not going to go into it very much. Just know that five are required for, um, to meet uh, criteria for diagnosis. Cole had seven of the eight criteria. Given that he was so young at 29 months, as I believe it was Dr. Walkovich already mentioned, there are uh, pri both primary and secondary causes of HLH. He was young, so we were concerned that there might be a primary. Um, uh, and he also had evidence of a dis immune dysregulation, um, given the expansion of B cells and the infection inside the T cells. So we thought there might be um, some genetic cause for it. His perforin was sent, which was possibly low, but it was also within the normal range, but, and genetic testing was negative. So he had a functional assay, which is the CD1078 mobilization assay, which was normal, so made um, a genetic cause of HLH less likely. However, Cole is obviously male, so flow was sent for both SAP and XIAP expression. His SAP was low, not completely deficient, but it was most certainly low in both TNK and NKT cells. So XLP1 and XLP2 genetic testing was sent, which was both negative. That kind of brings up the question of uh, if he had uh, a phenotypic picture that was uh, concerning for XLP1, he has low SAP, but at the same time the genetic testing is negative. So to briefly review um, what SAP is, it's, uh, this is a very, very brief review. Um, it, it's active most in the SLAM pathway with antibody-mediated ligation, which induces T cell activation and cytokine production. So SAP actually inhibits SLAM um, and acts as a natural suppressor of the SLAM-mediated T cell activation. But it's important because it's uh, also been demonstrated to be uh, important for cytotoxic activity in CD8 cells um, in class switching. Uh, and it also, uh, SAP deficiency leads to uh, chronic IVIG, so immunoglobulin requirement. So what normally happens in uh, acute infection of uh, EBV? So EBV causes mono, so infectious mononucleosis. So this is a study that looked at what SAP expression is in inf acute infectious uh, mononucleosis. As you can see here by the highlighted bars, um, at diagnosis, SAP levels are elevated in comparison to healthy controls. So another further evidence of um, ongoing immune dysregulation in coal. So what could be causing it? Uh, so we have T cells that are infected with EBV, and this would be normal where the pathway is activated. Um, so could EBV be causing it? And if so, what of all of these proteins that EBV encodes is? Luckily, somebody much smarter than I looked at all of this, and they thought LMP1 um, might be uh, a causative factor. And given that it's um, active through NF-kappa B, uh, which is important in transcription of certain proteins, this is a, a very good possibility. So the same, so, uh, same people. Um, did this study. So H9 and JERCAT are, are two different T cell lines. So if you look in the absence of LMP1, so uh, the bar to the far left, um, 
you have uh, SAP present. Um, however, when LMP1 is activated, you have almost uh, complete absence of SAP, at least in the H9 cell line. In the Jerkat cell line, you don't have complete absence, but you have significant lowering of uh, SAP expression in, in that setting. So this is how they proposed it works. So it effectively, LMP1 um, acts through NF-kappa B um, as a downregulation of transcription of SAP. Um, and that is effectively like almost an inducible um, XLP1 type phenotype. So what happened to Cole? Uh, Cole was treated with uh, pretty standard uh, therapy for HLH with decadron and etoposide. Given the EBV activation and the massive B cell proliferation, he was also treated with rituximab, which is an anti-CD1 uh, antibody that uh, Dr. Frame mentioned earlier. He, uh, he improved significantly. Um, later, the SAP was sent again, and at that point, it was normalized. So this was not a genetic cause, um, but uh, there was obviously some underlying immune dysregulation. He had persistent EBV viremia, and effectively would have met criteria for chronic active EBV, which is a, a bit of a separate topic, but he had um, at least detectable um, EBV for about two years, and it maxed out at about 5,000 copies at one point. He also had a persistent IVIG requirement, which again is present in SAP deficiency. So even though he improved and he did not have any further episodes of HLH or other significant illnesses, there was still some type of immune dysfunction, uh, immune, uh, immune dysregulation that was leading to this uh, chronic uh, problem. So what do we do? Um, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of thinking, even with people um, uh, down in Texas uh, when, uh, on visitors, and the eventual uh, the, the most important features are listed here. So he had the severity of the primary EBV infection, the massive B-cell proliferation, the decreased expression, and the continued um, IVIG dependence. With all of these things in told, there was concern that eventually he would have another episode of HLH, or that there might be something else that happened uh, that we uh, um, are not able to control the second time around. So the recommendation at this point was to undergo bone marrow transplant, which he did at five years of age. The primary indications are chronic active EBV, underlying immune dysregulation, and the most durable treatment, there's a lot of options with even the cytotoxic um, lymphocytes that have been talked about earlier, but the most durable treatment has been bone marrow transplant, as demonstrated in Japan and at the NIH here. So at this point, we have Cole who's doing quite well, and he might want to say a few words. I don't know, Cole. You think you want to say a few words? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never known him not to want to say a few words. You want to come up here, buddy? Here. Can you say hi? Mm -hmm. Want me to hold you up? Mm -hmm. Okay. Come here. Oh, come here. Can you say hi? Hi. You want to say anything? Um. I'm Cole, and um, what else do I say? I will eat it up. I will eat it cold when you're out of the ink. Good job, buddy. <laughs> go back to mom. Go back to mom. <laughs> so that's Cole. As you can see, he's pretty awesome. What else can he teach us, though? So. The two questions that I think are, are most important here is we don't really know why his um, T cells or NK cells became infected. So they don't express CD21 normally, but they do contain the mRNA. So do they transient express it, or is there something wrong in the immune system that makes them, or some type of infection that makes them? It's really unclear at this point. Also, in NK cells, there are certain proteins that are expressed that allow EBV to be infected, but it's only been shown in the lab and not been shown in people. Both of these could be potentially studied to figure out exactly what's going on and if there's something we should be testing for. The next thing is, is we know Cole looked like an XLP1 type phenotype. However, uh, he didn't have the genetic abnormalities and his SAP eventually normalized. So the, the final question is, we think that we know why, or why there might be a possibility with the LMP1 pathway. However, we really don't, and this has only been shown in labs. So showing it in, in a person who had the similar phenotype would be important to be able to diagnose what is actually going on. So that's the conclusion of my talk. Thank you to my mentors here at Michigan, Dr. Connolly and Walkovich, Dr. Boxer, and then Dr. Yannick, who's involved in some of my other research. So I'll take any questions at this point. <laughs> Dr. Torgerson. Very nice job. So um, I guess the other things that might be considered that have sort of come up probably since this has all happened, actually, fairly recently, would be MAG-T1 and uh, Pietro County sequence and Delta. Um, and then the other thing would be sequencing the, the SAP cDNA, actually, to see whether there are any 
Mepatronic potentially splicing defects that could potentially cause a non-functional SAP protein. Are those been considered at all? Not yet. <laughs> I have not heard of them yet, and I, I think we're, yeah, not, not as far as I know. You might be able to speak something further to that, Dr. Walker. Yeah, I know, like, a level for what that's worth for the max we want, uh, but we weren't able to get any further sequencing. We did do the standard and really to kind of like just pull up anything. Okay. Any questions? Well, thank you.